Good afternoon, uh, distinguished panelists. Good afternoon, delegates. My name is Tobena Erojikwe. I am the chairman of the governing board of the MBA Institute of Continuing Legal Education. It is my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you to today's session of the Corporate Insolvency and Restructuring uh, Training. And a topic for today's available insolvent restructuring tools. Our speaker for today is Dr. Bolanle Adebola. Bolanle is an associate professor of law at the University of Reading, United Kingdom. She's a leading expert in international commercial law. She specializes in corporate governance and insolvency law, as well as international commercial arbitration, which she teaches uh, through a module of a module accredited by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Her expertise cuts across the commercial law, uh, commercial law of both developed and emerging economies with particular knowledge of the laws of England and Wales, the United States and Nigeria. Balale actively engages in capacity building. She has contributed to the training of judges, regulators and practitioners. And practitioners. Uh, and practitioners. She was awarded the prestigious Arts and Human Research Council grant through which she established the Commercial Law Research Network Nigeria, a network that promotes research and knowledge exchange on matters relating to the development and reform of commercial law in emerging economies such as Nigeria. She was previously awarded a British Council Early Career Research Researcher Grant. Balanle, a Chartered Associate of the Corporate Governance Institute, the Assistant Secretary General of the Restructuring and Insolvency Committee of the Nigerian Bar Association, Section of Business Law, a Council Member of the Business Recovery and Insolvency Practitioners Association of Nigeria, and an academic member of INSOL International, INSOL Europe and Insolvency Lawyers Association. She's a member of the National Assembly Business Environment Roundtable Expert Network, as well as a fellow of the Higher Education Institute. She's also a contributing editor to the Lexis Nexis Encyclopedia of Banking. Balanlis Balale obtained her LLB from Malabi Siona University at Go Iwoye. 
BL from the Nigerian Law School, LLM from Bangor University, and PhD from the University College London. It is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce and indeed yield the floor to Bolanle. Bolanle. Yes, thank you very much. The floor is I yours. You, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your very warm welcome. I hope you can hear me quite all right. Yeah, we can hear you clearly. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, you know, to everyone who is tuned in this um, afternoon, you know, Saturday afternoons <laughs> are usually fun, but it's great that people have, turned, uh, have tuned in to uh, catch a lecture on insolvency law. I'm, um, I have a few slides with me, so I'm just going to turn on the slides uh, and share my screen. So I hope you can see my screen. Let me see if there's a slide show. Yes, I hope you can, can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's that's fine. All right. So, um, like um, as has been said today, I've been asked to talk about uh, some of the tools of insolvent restructuring. But um, before I do that, I think I'm going to start by, you know, trying to imagine the person who is going to be deploying this toolbox, this toolkit of tools that we have under the Nigerian insolvency system right about now. And in order to you know, start, I'm going to talk about some of the research that uh, we've been conducting. And when I mean we, I mean my research network, which is called the Commercial Law Research Network Nigeria, in collaboration with the um, NBA SBL, looking at um, insolvency ethics in Nigeria. And it's interesting that, um, yes, it's interesting that um, the, the first thing that the, so when we asked the practitioners, you know, we undertook some um, empirical research and that included both uh, survey, a survey, as well as um, semi-structured interviews, as we call them. So we interviewed uh, a number of stakeholders in Nigeria, and we asked them what they thought the challenges were uh, of the Nigerian insolvency practice. Well, I know that this is not um, very clear, but I will just tell you what's on the slide. So we coded the feedback that we got from the from the stakeholders that we interviewed. And this included uh, insolvency practitioners in Nigeria, both lawyers and accountants. It included uh, the regulator, that is CAC. It included um, judges of the Nigerian uh, Federal High Court, uh, as well as business, business persons and creditors, so banks. And 81% of the feedback uh, spoke of the, of the feedback on the challenges on, uh, on the Nigerian uh, insolvency practice spoke about professional competence. That is the competence of the practitioner. Sometimes where the practitioner has a good grasp of what is going on, uh, the, the inadequacies of the law may be tempered, but where we have practitioners who struggle to understand um, the law, we then find that they struggle to deploy even the resources that, um, that they are. So, um, so that's important for us. The other talked about the framework of Kama 20, the framework of, of Kama. Well, we know that Kama has recently been reformed. And so we know that the professional who takes charge of a company that is struggling now has a bigger toolkit. And I suppose that that is why we're having the conversation that we're having today. It is important for us to build the norms. So one of the challenges of Kama 1990 is that the norms that they sought to introduce into the system were not built into the practitioners. Therefore, uh, what the NBA is doing right now is very commendable. And um, I would, of course, encourage them to carry 
this on in order to improve the, Niger the institutional framework of insolvency in Nigeria. Finally, there were um, challenges of, of stakeholder competence as well. Uh, you know, uh, debtors run into the court every time there is a slight problem or any time that the deeds that they have signed uh, is to be enforced against them. But I'm just going to focus because we are dealing with practitioners today. I'm going to focus a bit more on some of the challenges that were highlighted. So it was said that the greatest challenge of the insolvency practitioner in Nigeria is the professionalism of its practitioners. And when we uh, sought to dig deeper to understand what they felt was the problem, um, the feedback said that one, uh, professionals in Nigeria suffer from um, gaps in their conceptual competence, also gaps in their procedural competence, gaps in their relational competence, as well as gaps in their social competence. And I'm just going to explain what some of these mean uh, one after the other. So in terms of conceptual competence, this refers to the understanding of the professionals of the concepts that they're dealing with. Now, this is quite challenging in um, Nigeria because sometimes when we uh, take up, so I can, uh, if I recall, you know, one of the cases in Nigeria, the Wema Bank and Onofo Okon case, which looked at uh, whether uh, to appoint a receiver, you need an order of the court, even though you're appointing the receiver out of court. That spoke to uh, conceptual competence because where practitioners understand that uh, you don't need an order of court for an out of court appointment of a practice of an insolvency practitioner or a receiver and manager quite specifically then we wouldn't spend as much time as was spent in the court uh, they spent up to a decade between you know, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court on that case, arguing over a matter that should have been understood by all of the parties, such that even when your stakeholders, such as the debtors, encourage uh, you know, actions that are known to be right, to be challenged, then the practitioner can advise the stakeholder that this is not uh, the way to set about things. So conceptual competence is really key and it was identified as the most important one. And again, that is why we're dealing with concepts. And that's why I'm taking the time to explain uh, the context in which the conversations that we're having now and that we will continue to have are taking place. We also then have issues of procedural competence. Of course, the example that I have given speaks not only of conceptual competence, it speaks also of procedural competence. It's important that practitioners understand the steps that should be taken one after the other. And as we improve on the procedural competence, we will find that the insolvency system works perhaps quicker and much better than it has in the past. There are also issues of relational competence. Now, relational competence speaks to the relationship between the insolvency practitioner and the other stakeholders uh, in the insolvency system. Uh, one of the things that some practitioners mentioned, and of course you can imagine the debtors uh, emphasize, was the fact that when practitioners enter into the company, they enter into the company as, uh, you know, some people said they enter as though they are the Lord Almighty, and they come in with the, uh, with the assumption that something wrong has gone on, and they refuse to engage the other stakeholders of the company. We will find uh, as we you know, look through the procedures that we're dealing with, that it is no longer the case that an insolvency practitioner is expected to enter into a company and immediately get rid of the directors of the company. It has been found that it is easier for the uh, practitioner to deliver on the practitioner's responsibilities where they find room for communication with the other uh, stakeholders of the company, and they find room for engagement of perhaps the managers of the company. And so uh, an insolvency practitioner is supposed to look at what the concept and the procedure say about engaging with the managers of the company or the directorship of the company. This is particularly important when you find that the owners of the company are also the managers of the company or that the managers of the company are also the owners of the company. Because when you enter to look to get rid of those people, they are not only fighting uh, a, a system 
system, they are fighting for their lives and their livelihoods and what they have spent the entirety of their lives building. And it's important to understand that as the basis for a lot of the uh, fight back that takes place. Of course, this is not saying that you allow the um, stakeholders run roughshod, but that you understand how to manage these relationships. And then there's finally uh, social competence. Social competence is at the um, at the foundation of the changes that were introduced in 2020, in Kama 2020. Now, of course, uh, several people would say that we have transitioned from a system that uh, looks to simply extract value from a company into a system that looks to conserve the value that is in the company. Now, conserving value um, is based on um, a, a worldview that looks at the role of companies in an economy. Uh, companies are important because, of course, you expect them to pay taxes. We also expect that companies would um, employ persons. And so in some communities, it is that company that keeps the community going. Of course, again, you would find that for those who go to a community to try to take control of uh, a company, you might find that the members of the community fight back uh, very hard. So I think that as we continue to speak not only about the procedure, but the context in which these procedures um, apply, we might find that we're able to bridge the gap of understanding of the insolvency practice, which is necessary to ensure that it is, um, it is implemented uh, in a way that is beneficial to all of the parties, all of the stakeholders that um, are involved. And so with that, I would then move to look at, um, to provide an overview of the insolvency system in Nigeria. Again, uh, prior to 2020, you usually would look at Kama at the, as the main source of our insolvency system. So that requires us to look at, you know, the Companies and Allied Matters Act. But if you are dealing with winding up, you also then have to look at the winding up rules. And because you have to go into the Federal High Court, which has exclusive jurisdiction over matters to do with company law, you'd also have to look at the Federal High Court rules. Now, there has been a slight shift, or the, well, there was a slight shift when AMCON was introduced because AMCON was created to deal with specific types of debt. And so when you're dealing with the biggest companies dealing with debts that have been sold onto AMCON, you'd find that the parties have to look at the AMCON Act uh, 2010 as amended. That's not what we're looking at in the main today because that has its own specific procedures. What we're focusing on is KAMA, KAMA 2020 for today. But it's important that you understand that since 2020 and the changes that have been introduced into, uh, into the Nigerian system, we no longer look at KAMA as the main source or KAMA and the winding up rules as the main source. It's important that if you want to understand the procedural rules uh, that apply or that pertain to KAMA 2020 today, you also have to look at the insolvency regulations that were introduced in 2022. So, if, for example, you want to run an administration, uh, in order to know how to call a meeting, the notice of the meeting, uh, how to accept a proof of claims, uh, who will chair the meeting, all those types of um, administrative rules, procedural rules, are found in the insolvency regulations of 2022. For those who are interested in the regulations for insolvency practitioners, you know, how you get your authorization, how often you have to uh, renew your authorization you would also be looking at the insolvency regulations 2022. Hence, when you are reading uh, insolvency law in Nigeria today, it's best to start with those three on top in green. So your Kama 2020, your insolvency regulations 2022, your company's winding up rules uh, as they are important, and then every other regulation as may be necessary. If you're dealing with um, the with, uh, insurance companies, you know, you look at NICOM and the Insurance Act, if you are dealing with banks, you look at BOFIA, you know, all of those would also apply. 
So let's look at the overview of insolvency procedures that we have today in Nigeria. Um, the main insolvency procedures that we have, well, when a company is insolvent, you know, you know the act, Kama explains what insolvency is when the company is unable to pay its debt as one of them as they fall due, whether the company is cash flow insolvent or the company is balance sheet insolvent. Now there is a number of options that are open to the practitioner. Uh, and so, you know, one option which actually is quite useful in Nigeria, you'd find, is the out of court workout. I know that that has been taken yesterday. Uh, because of the, uh, because there is no publicity to deal uh, in, in the case of the out of court workouts, you would find that many debtor companies are more amenable to an out of court workout. But of course, the challenge with your out of court workout is that uh, you need unanimity. And so it is important you, you then have start um, considering how you might deal with your coordination problems or your coordination challenges, the coordination of the various uh, stakeholders, particularly your creditors that would be involved. And the chances that uh, one or more creditors looking to obtain full value might decide to abstain or you know, stay away from accepting whatever deal is proposed on the, um, in the hope that they would be paid off in full and that they might therefore you know, live with full payment while other people uh, receive less than they are owed. So again, I would advise that you reflect on the um, yesterday's event to get up to speed with the principles, with some of the principles that are applied uh, these days across the globe uh, in effecting out of court workouts. We also have a different set of workouts when you have the challenge or when you perceive that you are unlikely to attain unanimity. Now, the statute provides the option for the company to make a proposal to its stakeholders. Now, there are two main types of proposals, or proposals can be made under two main types of procedures. Uh, you have your company voluntary arrangements and your schemes of arrangement, and we will take some time to go into uh, each of these shortly. Now. We also have the option that is well known to most Nigerians, our most, most used, most hated um, procedure, which is receivership. Uh, you, we know that there are different types of receivers. We have your receiver simpliciter, you have your receiver and manager. Your receiver can be appointed in court, your receiver can be appointed out of court. Uh, the one that we, that I think most st stakeholders love to hate, and for those of, of us that have been appointed in that position, has been the receiver and manager appointed under an all assets debenture out of court. And we will look at that uh, shortly as well. Uh, in addition to receivership now, 2020 has introduced administration. Administration finds its roots in receivership, but works differently from receivership. And again, we will spend a bit of time just looking at both. Now, the four procedures that I have talked about mainly are procedures that you deploy where the goal is to rescue the company. Most people are uncomfortable with the idea of receivership as a rescue mechanism, but because under an all asset debenture, the receiver has, the receiver manager has powers over the whole or substantially the whole of the company's assets, it puts that receiver and manager in a special position to make a decision about the company as a whole or its business. Therefore, if the uh, practitioner deploys their responsibilities as they should, they stand in the position position to help to rescue the company. And again, you know, you remember, we go back to our competencies, the conceptual competence, but importantly, the social competence and the relational competence. But where these are on like where it is unlikely or where there are stiff challenges, uh, where it comes to the state of the company's uh, financial position, it is possible that the company is, you know, passed on into liquidation. But the, um, we have two types of liquidation. We have voluntary liquidation and we have compulsory liquidation. But when it comes to insolvent liquidation, we're looking at your creditor's voluntary liquidation because the member's voluntary liquidation requires a declaration of solvency, which means that uh, the directors are saying that the company can afford to pay its debt within a period of time, which is 
is within a 12 month window. Uh, in, an, in the event that they cannot make this statutory declaration would be, uh, would be in the position of a creditor's voluntary liquidation. Now, the fact that a company is in a liquidation does not mean that the practitioner cannot, having taken a view of the entire situation of the company, decide that there's actually something that is salvageable. And because it is salvageable, the liquidator can actually deploy a number of options uh, in order to try to rescue the company. We will find that some of the rescue procedures that we have can actually de be deployed in liquidation um, as well. So with that, I hope that I, you know, I've taken a, quite a bit of time to set out some of the background issues so that you know, as time goes, depending on you know, how interested people are, we hope that people are interested, people will engage much more uh, in, in undertaking training on this area of the law. Now, the procedures that I have talked about, particularly the rescue procedures, um, globally are, can be organized into management displacing and management replacing procedure. Now, we, we know that several people are encouraged to undertake and that they do undertake international um, training. And so it's important that we get to speed with the language that is used in the global framework. And you'd find that in the past uh, couple of days of the training that has been ongoing, you'd find that the language that is being used is in sync with the language that is being used globally to ensure that our conversations align. Now, in the case of um, restructuring procedures in the main, uh, your management displacing procedures are those procedures where when the practitioner takes control, the practitioner displaces the management of the company. In that case, the, manage, uh, the practitioner takes the place of the organs of the company. And so that practitioner makes decisions that direct the, the uh, steps that the company can take without recourse to the management of the company. But we have management retaining procedures, which you find that, that debtors are mainly interested in. Again, if you remember the competencies that I, I discussed. Debtors are interested in procedures that keep them in place because, of course, that means that they don't get thrown out of uh, a company that they spent their life building. Well, you would find that uh, this does not always mean that you then, you then don't get to change some of the directors or senior officers of the company. But the two main management retaining procedures that we have are our schemes of arrangement procedure and our company voluntary arrangement procedure. And again, like I said, we will get into this shortly. So in the little time that I have, I'm going to, that I have left, I will go into a comparison of some of these procedures. Now, there's a reason why I go into a comparison of some of these procedures. I prefer to proceed from that which is known into the unknown. I think that I have more of a mathematical brain. And so in maths, you know, you use the known variables to solve for your unknown. But also because all these procedures that we're talking about are interlinked. You find that their roots are similar. Therefore, your understanding of one procedure would assist in your understanding of the new procedures. But of course, you know, I should put the caveat that, that, that it is your proper understanding of the initial uh, procedure that would ensure your uh, proper understanding of the new procedure. So, um, I have paired receivership and administration, and I've also paired your uh, CBA and our schemes of arrangement. Now, the reason why I pair receivership and administration is that they have the same roots and they work in a similar way. So receivership and administration are both management displacing procedures. That means that when the practitioner is appointed, the powers of the directors are in abeyance. It does not mean that the directors are immediately removed from the office. Uh, their powers are in abeyance. Um, and so they cannot utilize those powers unless they are permitted to do so by the um, insolvency practitioner, or perhaps if they can appeal to the court's equitable jurisdiction and the court finds that what they're um, asking for is, um, is permissible. But of, the expectation is that this would be 
less often <laughs> than, 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 than more or than not. Now, um, the, both procedures can be commenced either in court or out of court, but you would expect that in the receivership, the receiver that we tend to deal with, and I'd like to just call that the section 553 receiver, because that's your, your receiver that has the rights over the whole or substantially the whole of the company's affairs. That's the receiver appointed under a, an all asset debenture. It, that receiver is usually appointed out of court. Now for administration, if the administration is going to involve a cross-border element, it is advised, you know, the statute requires, and it is strongly advised that the in-court route is taken. Also, we find that in the out or unlike receivership where the appointment is by a debenture holder, in the case of administration, there are three, uh, well, the two routes that we have in court and out of court um, permit different people to make the appointment. So the in court uh, process can be commenced by application by members of the company, that is your shareholders. It can be commenced by unsecured creditors of the company. It can be commenced by secured creditors of the company and a number of other persons that are listed in the statute. The out of court route is open to the company uh, when it passes a resolution to that effect or to the um, directors in meeting, you know, as an organ when they pass a resolution to that effect. And uh, the out of court procedure can also be undertaken by uh, the holder of a qualifying floating charge. Your qualifying floating charge is your all asset um, debenture, uh, usually just to you know, speak as simply as possible. Uh, in the case, there are differences in the procedure for in court and out of court. And I would encourage everyone to take a look at it. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I'm supposed to have five minutes more, but I'm going to nick five extra minutes uh, and finish at 14.40 and then leave room for um, discussion for that. Uh, again, it's important to compare the differences between the objectives of receivership and the objectives of um, administration. Actually, my maths is wrong. Uh, it's 14.45. Yes, because we started five minutes past. Okay, so it's important to uh, note the difference between the objectives of receivership and the objective of administration. Even though our receivership in, in Nigeria, if you actually look at the provisions of section 553 is, stakeholderist in its approach, which requires the receiver to actually take into consideration the interests of the company and the interests of other stakeholders in the company. It is still the case that the interests of the debenture holder uh, rank above the interests of the other stakeholders in the company. But in the case of administration, the, the vision or the, the, the purview is quite different. Administration was created to enable the rescue first of the company. And it is where it is not possible to rescue the company that you seek to realize a better outcome for the uh, creditors of the company as a group uh, than would have been the case if you had gone into liquidation directly. That's just a very long-winded way of saying, if you cannot rescue the company, you try to rescue its business because that's the only way you can achieve a better um, outcome. The meaning of that is you actually get more money when you sell a going concern than when you sell a business that is not creating or producing anything and you want to sell its assets uh, piecemeal. Now, again, uh, it is only where you cannot achieve the rescue of the company or achieve the rescue of the business that the insolvency practitioner might look into a piecemeal sale, uh, into, a, uh, into a sale of assets for distribution to one or more creditors. So it's important that we understand the differences between the objectives of both procedures. There is also um, the fact that administration comes with a stay. A stay is a shield. It's a protective shield that is afforded the company from hostile actions. I mean, all Nigerians are aware that as soon as a receiver manager is appointed or, or any form of insolvency practitioner is appointed, you know, all, all, all routes go to the court and people are suing at the state high court for debt enforcement. They are suing at the federal high court for all sorts of things. All that 
does not apply or is not permissible in administration. And there are two forms of stay that you have in administration. You have your interim stay and you have your full stay. And it's important, again, that practitioners are aware of the uh, procedure for each, the application of each, and the implications of each, particularly, again, as pertains to the rights of the qualifying floating charge holder. It's important to understand that even though an interim moratorium or an interim stay is in place, the uh, Qualifying floating charge holder, that's the holder of that all asset debenture, has some powers. It is possible for them to still appoint a receiver manager. It's possible for them to appoint a receiver, to appoint an administrator out of court. And that might then affect you know, the procedure that is already ongoing. But as soon as a full moratorium is kicked into play, then you find that uh, those powers can no longer be um, exercised. The receivership does not come with a stay, but you know that there are contractual protections that the receiver has uh, for the assets that fall within the purview of the debenture. As always in Nigeria, it is advised that the practitioner ensures that the assets that they take control of are the assets that they actually have a right to. We tend to you know, have this overreach and you know, those are the things that cause problems that require you know, the stakeholders to go to court and for us to spend so much time in the court. Uh, we've talked about the impact on management displacement. Uh, both of them are management displacing, but Administration actually encourages much more than receivership because the goal is rescue for the practitioner to look to ensure that they, they find a way of uh, relating with the management of the company. Again, remember uh, working with an understanding that relational competence is necessary. We also have differences in the responsibilities of the um, insolvency practitioner. Again, the responsibility of the receiver manager is mainly, but not exclusively, mainly to, uh, the, to the mortgagee, to the appointor, while the responsibility of the administrator is to the creditors as a group. And that's the reason why administration is more rescue oriented. I should also point out that, you know, with this great responsibility that the administrator has been given, the administrator has been given additional powers that the receiver does not have. Particularly, you know, you have, uh, um, the power to deal with assets that are subject to security in a way that the receiver does not have. But there, of course, there are built-in protections for those that are holding on, uh, those that hold the you know, encumbrances under those um, securities. Um, we also then have the issue of duration. Uh, most people know that receivership can go on forever. And so receiver receiverships, as I said before I was born, and I think some of them are still ongoing, as some practitioners will tell me. Well, with administration, you know, it's short, it's sharp, it's sweet. So it's for one year, but there are options of extending. But in order to extend, uh, you know, there are some um, justifications that must be made. So in all, we can see how, although administration relates to receivership in that they are both management displacing, they both, or, 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 um, they both start from the security that uh, is held over the assets of the company. They differ in the way that they apply. And it's important that practitioners get to speed with it. So the choice between administration and receivership really de depends on the position of the practitioner. If there is a debenture in place, or if there's no debenture in place, I know someone approached me uh, not so long ago and said, look, there's no debenture in place. Can we appoint a receiver manager under the court and ask the receiver manager to do X or Y? I was like, why don't you just you know, uh, apply to the court for the appointment of an administrator and all of the things that you're saying you would be able to do even though you are an unsecured creditor. So as always, it's important for us to understand the context, understand the procedures, and then understand how to deploy them. I can see that we have a number of hands raised. I think I'll just go through uh, the presentation and then we can take up a few of the questions. So I move then swiftly to the arrangements that we have. Um, we. I've already said that you had your out of court arrangements discussed yesterday. So we'd be looking at your statutorily provided um, arrangements. Now, 
we have two main types of arrangements available to us under Karma 2020. We have the schemes of arrangement and we have the CBA. As always, you know, I said I compare that which we don't know with that which we know, or I link them up so that we start from a position of awareness. We all know schemes of arrangement, 1990, Forum Bank and all of those banks. We all know uh, schemes of arrangement, 2004, uh, Intercontinental going into access, you know, all of those banks. So we all know the story and we all know how it, it works. Um, both of them are out of court procedures. But remember that with the schemes of arrangement, you actually require two trips to the court. One is to get an order to convene a meeting, and the other is to get an order to confirm a proposal that has been, uh, that has been approved. For the CBA, it's also an out-of-court procedure. However, there are also two routes to the CBA. So you have your route to the CBA that the directors can commence. And that is the route that uh, requires the appointment of an insolvency practitioner. And the reason was quite simple, or the reason that that was introduced was quite simple. It was introduced because by the time that the directors of the company are struggling to uh, control a company that is sliding into insolvency, you know, and trying to prevent that ir irreversible slide into insolvency, it's difficult for them to start to hurt their stakeholders as well at the same time. And so it was decided that an insolvency practitioner who is an expert in this type of procedure and an is an, and a relational expert would be appointed to take control of the arrangement procedure. And that's why you have a nominee. Now that before the nominee is appointed, um, you, it is expected that that practitioner would have worked with the directors to come up with a proposal. Please understand that the nature of responsibility of the practitioner before entering into the formal appointment is different. So the fiduciary liabilities and responsibilities before appointment, and then your statutory liabilities and responsibilities after um, appointment. Uh, where the nominee is involved because the directors are in charge, then there's a process to follow. You know, the nominee has to be notified, a proposal has to be given to them, and then the nominee has to file a report on that proposal where they consent to the appointment and they uh, state that uh, the, there's a chance that the um, objectives of the proposal would be met and that a meeting should therefore be called. So again, it's important to understand the differences in procedure. Um, remember that I said that the fact that a company is in liquidation does not mean that you cannot have um, a rescue. So one of the ways that you can actually rescue a company in liquidation is to propose a CBA. And so you have a route for a CBA within a liquidation, a route for a CBA within administration. Typically, where you are looking for a stay, that is the protective shield, you might want to place the company into administration because that permits you to trade the company easily. But it is not unheard well, let me not say it's not unheard of. It is, it is possible to place the CVA into a liquidation as well, but there are much more restrictions on trading, although the liquidator can trade for the beneficial uh, winding up of the company's affairs. So again, you should note the, you know, these are technical differences that should be taken into consideration and should be known to the expert insolvency practitioner when they're looking to decide which option uh, to take. So just to recap, you have two routes into your CBA. You have a route where the directors are the ones initiating, and that means they have to seek the appointment of a nominee who is an insolvency practitioner. But if we go the route of a of administration of a CVA within an administration and liquidator. Already the administrator or the liquidator is an insolvency practitioner. So there's no need uh, for them to seek another expert. Now, again, you look at the differences in objectives. The objective really is to propose a deal. There are some slight technical differences, but you know, for now we can just leave that aside. Um, the scheme of arrangement proposes an arrangement to all of your members or all of your creditors or to a class of them. So you can use that for a partial or a full restructuring of the company. But a CVA 
proposes an arrangement to the entirety of your unsecured creditors, bear in mind is your unsecured creditors alone. Because while you can use your scheme of arrangement to uh, compromise the, the um, what's the word, to compromise the position or the entitlements of secured creditors, you cannot compromise the entitled entitlement of secured creditors or the entitlement of your preferential creditors as preferential creditors within a CVA. And also in the case of a CVA, the CVA is proposed to the unsecured creditors as a group. You don't have classes of them. And then is there a stay? Well, section 717 now uh, provides a stay for a restructuring scheme unlike a CVA that doesn't come with a stay, if you need a stay for your CVA, then like I said already, you embed it in either a liquidation or in an administration. Of course, the challenge with that is that your directors become agitated because that means that they lose control of the company. And so you might find that your, your directors are not as interested in a, in a CVA embedded in a uh, a different procedure and it's also much more expensive you know as well then you uh, the impact on the management both the cva and the schemes of arrangement are management retaining and so they are more um acceptable to management uh also uh, in terms of duration there's no fixed duration for either your schemes of arrangement or your cva i should also mention the opportunities to challenge uh, there's an opportunity to challenge the cva you know at different points and so you usually have to wait for a period of 28 days after uh the cva has been approved uh in order to see whether anyone is going to uh, challenge the outcomes of the CBA. And then I'll go in my very, very last minutes, Kobe, I know I have an eye on the clock, my very, very, very last minutes into uh, the potential for rescue within a liquidation. Of course, the idea of a liquidation is that you're winding down the affairs of the company and you're bringing you know, everything to an end for the sake of selling off the assets of the company, making distributions, if any possible, and then you know, looking for dissolution, and that's the end of the life of the, uh, of the company. However, the fact that a company is in liquidation does not mean that you cannot rescue the company. And uh, you also, the fact that um, uh, liquidation tends to signal the end of the company does not mean that the practitioner cannot commence with the liquidation. Well, it is not my preference. It's not my most recommended procedure. And you find that in several jurisdictions where, for example, a CVA can be done within a liquidation, we don't have a single case in the UK where a CVA has been done within a liquidation because of those restrictions on trading. But in uh, several common law countries, you find that trading is possible so far as it is for the uh, it is for the beneficial resolution of the debtor's um, affairs. And so you find a similar rule in um, Nigeria. Again, uh, sometimes you find that the rules are clearer on company voluntary liquidation than they are on compulsory liquidation. And then you find that some of the um, protections afforded under one are not afforded under the other. So, you know, the outright um, stay in the compulsory liquidation does not pertain in voluntary liquidation. You seem to have a bit more flexibility as a voluntary liquidator appointed uh, as a liquidator appointed under a voluntary system than you have under a compulsory liquidation. You know, you look at all of those exigencies when deciding what option to take. But of course, you can have a CBA within a liquidation. You can have a scheme of arrangements within a liquidation, and you can use your liquidation in order to effect a business sale you know, as a going concern, in which case you try to trade the company so that you can maximize the value that is locked in all of those assets. And with that, I think I've come to the end. I've stood in two extra minutes and I think I've come to the end of the presentation. So I'll stop sharing and then we can move to the Q&A. Over to you, Kubi and Okori. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Debola. I mean, if this was um, a physical gathering, I would have asked for a standing ovation. I I'm not surprised you've done justice to the topic. Thank you very much for the very insightful presentation within a very limited time. So I think we still have um, some time for questions and I've noted some of them down here. And please, I, I, I want to appeal to the attendees that if you have questions, you have to post them. 
I've been trying to lower hands and some people are still raising their hands. Okay, so um, let's take the first. So this attendee is asking the main difference between liquidation and restructuring. Okay, well, yes, I would say that you're dealing with a procedure and a concept. So again, that goes back to some of the competencies that we were talking about. Liquidation is a procedure. Restructuring is an idea. So you have, you could place the idea, which is restructuring in different types of procedures. And that's what I've tried to explain to us today. Now, the idea behind liquidation usually is that you are trying to get the company to the end of its life. That said, it does not mean that you cannot even when we start off by seeing that the company should die, we cannot find out that, do you know, if we, uh, what's, you know, when you try to resuscitate, maybe there's a defibrillator, the, you look at the company and say, okay, the company has had a heart attack, but we can resuscitate this company if we had, uh, you know, if we applied certain procedures. Now, the idea behind restructuring is that the company is ill and you are trying to rehabilitate the company. Uh, of course, sometimes that means that you cut off the uh, cancerous bits, you cut off the offending bits of the company, but that the goal is that you are trying to protect the company from an ultimate failure. I should point out that um, there are different, so there are different, um, um, there, are, there are concepts with quite, quite close meanings. So you could try to rescue a company that is the person, the company is the person that enters into transactions. But you could also try, you could also recognize the fact that you can't actually save the company, but you can save its business. The business is the part of the company that makes money. So you can eject that business and sell it on to a company that does not have the financial difficulties that that past company has. Um, so just to reiterate so that I don't confuse the person who asked the question, liquidation really is a procedure and it's a process that is statutory and outlined in the law. Restructuring is the idea that you can deploy procedures to prevent uh, the company's life or its business's life from coming to an end. Thank you very much. Um, there's an interesting question here from my friend, Max Ikombe. So he's asking how easy and possible it is to switch between two options when a particular procedure has started and the company has, um, I mean, there's been significant changes. And he gives an example. He says, for instance, if a company is in liquidation and then finds a business opportunity that gives it a lifeline, how easy can it switch to administration? Well, um, I think Kama outlines the well, again, this is where I should say, let me not mix up my UK law with Nigerian law, <laughs> because I know that my UK law permits switch, switching quite, uh, you know, reasonably. So if the liquidator sees that, you know, uh, there is a possibility that you can save them, the opportunities to switch to uh, administration are there. I would have to check Kama a lot more closely. One of the things that I always say to people is, don't, don't read Nigerian law as, the, as though you're reading English law. Um, I think that given that we followed the same act, uh, that option of switching is there, but there is usually the option of switching really from one procedure to the other, and it is the responsibility of the insolvency practitioner. I, uh, some of the procedures are quite clear. So if the CVA is not working, for example, the uh, supervisor or the after the CBA has been uh, has entered into the implementation phase, or the nominee before the um, approval stage can actually petition that the or apply to the court that there should be a switch from CBA to perhaps administration or perhaps liquidation. Um, um, I um, an administrator can also then say, look, there's nothing to salvage here, there's no point in the money. I think that you can switch from a liquidation. I know I, liquidation. I definitely know we can do in the UK, but I would have to double check for you on the Nigerian one. Uh, uh, Doc, just a, a very quick clarification. Hi, Kubi, as well. Um, just a follow up to that question. Uh, when you spoke on the um, uh, the fact that you can embed rescue procedures uh, into liquidation, 
right? My, my question would be, depending on the procedure, uh, would uh, the liquidator be discharged? If he switches to into a CVA, if he switches into no. administration, I think no. administration is clear. Administration is clear. You would have to convert the office of the um, of the practitioner. But with a scheme of arrangement or a CVA, you don't. Uh, the law recognizes that you can have a CVA embedded in a liquidation, and you can have a scheme of arrangement embedded in a liquidation. Okay, um, Doc. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here, and I think it's something you explained before. But let's just give the person the benefit of doubt. Says. The scheme of arrangement, how exactly does it differ from a CVA? I know you are taking time to explain this, so you may just go through it quickly. Okay, and I think the other one, the part that I should answer, perhaps, I think how what the person really wants to know is the second uh, part of the question. How does one you know, become a better option than the other? I think it all exactly. depends on what it is that the practitioner is trying to handle. And again, you know, that's how, how we're talking about this conceptual competence thing. If what you want to do involves uh, compromising the entitlement of a secured creditor. You can only do that with a scheme of arrangement. If what you want to do does not involve compromising the entitlement of a secured creditor, what you want to do is to compromise the interests of or the entitlement of unsecured creditors, then a CBA affords you uh, a greater latitude uh, to, to do that. There's also the fact that with these days, because of section 717, uh, the stay that you have with the schemes of arrangement uh, offers better protection to the company. However, it's important to understand that a scheme of arrangement is much more expensive than a CBA because a scheme of arrangement involves quite a number of trips to the courts. And you might then get to the end, you know, and then people start arguing over whether the classes are properly constituted or not properly constituted. And that leads to a lot of litigation. So it, you weigh the options and then you pick the one that best serves the particular case that you have. Thank you very much. And then, okay, someone is asking, bearing in mind that administration follows a hierarchical or that tripod objectives, can the administrator switch in the midst of pursuing those objectives? I guess one objective to another objective, the last yes. of which is ultimate liquidation. Yes. So, uh, yes, that's a great question. You know, the one thing I enjoy about Nigerian uh, interaction is the way we use this English. I like that. <laughs> um, yes. So what the law actually says is that where the, uh, the administrator thinks that A cannot be achieved, that is a subjective test. So it is what the administrator thinks. And uh, we have case law in the UK where, you know, it has been challenged that uh, there's an objective process to it. There isn't an objective process to it. So it is, it offers far more latitude than we, some people might like, but it allows the um, insolvency experts to deploy their expert eye uh, to the situation that they have before them and then take a decision based on what they think is right. The insolvency practitioner is encouraged to avoid a liquidation outcome where possible in the case of administration. Don't, let me add that, bear in mind that the administrator has accountability responsibilities. And you might then find that if you, um, if the administrator perversely takes a decision that then unfairly prejudices the interests of other creditors, they have the option of attacking the decisions that have been made by the administrator through that route. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think you've been mentioning insolvency practitioner repeatedly, and, and someone here has asked who can practice as an insolvency practitioner and whether um, a law firm or a firm can be appointed an insolvency practitioner. I know you may not be able to detail all the criteria for, uh, um, for, for qualification, but you can just no, summarize that. I, I would just say advice versus to go and look at the insolvency regulations. I think it requires having been uh, five years in practice, but that there's the alternative for those who have not been five years in practice to have um, a um, commendation 
from a person who has had that experience uh, to write on their behalf to talk about the relationship and the mentoring that has taken place between them because uh, the CAC recognized the fact that quite a number of people might be entering into this new and it talks about being a member of a professional, a recognized professional body and there are five recognized professional bodies in Nigeria. You have your Anan, ICANN, BRIPAN, uh, the NBA itself, uh, and whichever one they're, they're supposed to be, and ICANN. So you have five of yeah. them. Yes, yeah. uh, and then when you receive the training and become a member of that uh, body, you then seek authorization from the CAC itself. And then the CAC uh, applies some of its other, you know, fit, uh, whether you're a fit person and the like, and it is important that you keep up the renewal. I think it's every three years or so. Um, it's a person that is appointed as an insolvency practitioner, not an, a firm. I know that in Nigeria, we've had some quite interesting cases where a firm is appointed as a receiver. And it's a person, not a firm uh, that is appointed. Thank you very much. I think I'll ask my own question before we wrap up. And it has to do with, you said something about retaining, just for clarification. And um, you said in CVS and schemes, management is retained. But some of us may be worried that, look, some of these guys that are being retained, they may have been the cause why this company is in trouble. So is there any wriggle room that we can kick them out you know, while this restructuring is going on? So we won't end up finding ourselves where we started from. Yes. Hmm. Okay, that's a very interesting question. And for this, and you know, it's only somebody who has a PhD in solvency law that brings up all those kind of questions. So Kubi, thank you very much. For this, I'm going to have to draw our attention to, you know, I don't know how many people are registered on this. I always say, hmm, when we are looking across the Atlantic Ocean, practice do as they do, don't practice do as they say. So you find that the closest uh, parallel to this is chapter 11, which retains the data. And the assumption is that it retains the management of the company. But you find that if you look statistically behind the facade of retaining the debtor, uh, there is usually a change in the management. Remember that I said the fact that you retain does not mean you can't change some of the directors. And this is where relational competence comes to bear. That sometimes it is going to have to be the case that uh, the, the airing um, the airing director is made to understand how their position is problematic and why they might have to step aside for the sake of the company. And the law gives us a lot of carrots, but it also gives a stick. You know, the, um, the director can be advised that if the company slides back into an insolvent procedure and the company thereby slides into uh, an insolvent liquidation, then the company stands, the, the director stands the chance of a wrongful trading action being brought potentially against them. For that reason, it might be best for them to you know, step aside or to agree the appointment of someone who can veto some of the actions that they might be taking. And if I could just say that uh, we do have all of many, several of the cases of restructurings that have been successful in Nigeria have been done outside of the law that is within the shadow of the law. And it usually involves the appointment of a director uh, onto the board who has been given some veto rights over some of the decisions that have been taken by the directors of the company. And that is a way of keeping the management in place, but ensuring that you can control the actions that they take. Thank you very, very much. I think this is a convenient place, you know, to call it a day. Um, on behalf of Tobena Erojikwe, the chairman, MBA LICLE, I want to thank you immensely for finding time out of your very busy schedule to be with us. We thoroughly enjoyed your uh, presentation. It was extremely, extremely insightful. Thank you so much. And we hope that when next we knock on your door, you would oblige us. And I also want to thank um, our attendees for finding time out of their busy schedules on South Bay to be with us. You know, I can see we have a very full house and I want to apologize for attendees for the questions we've not been able to answer due to limited time. And before we go, I just want to remind us that the next session will be coming up on the 15th of June, 2023, from 2 to 3 p.m. 
and it will deal with loan restructuring anatomy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, and I wish you a very pleasant weekend. Thank you. Thank you.